Today, I'm going to be describing the LifeView platform from Genomic Prediction. My name is Nathan Treff. I'm the co-founder, chief science officer, and clinical laboratory director. This slide serves as an outline of the focus of the talk. I'll be describing our PGTA, PGTSR, PGTM, and PGTP capabilities. And we've really spent quite a bit of time developing these technologies so that uh, in each of the categories, we have the most advanced testing available on the market. To provide some background on our company, we founded in 2017, uh, myself, Laron Tellier, and Stephen Shu. <clears throat> we spent the first year validating methodologies in the laboratory. In 2019, we received CLIA and CAP accreditation. Last year, we were providing services for over 150 IVF clinics, and we're now up to over 240. One of the uh, things that we focused on is, is really uh, supporting all of the work that we do with peer-reviewed research. I'm going to just flip through several publications, uh, some of which I'm going to be talking about in more detail uh, during this talk. We also have several ongoing clinical trials, which again is um, just to illustrate our dedication to advancing the field of IVF and genetic testing. To start, I'll focus on PGTA. Most, <clears throat> most laboratories in the industry use something called next generation sequencing. These are a couple of examples of the type of data that is obtained uh, from these platforms. Uh, for example, VeriSeq or ReproSeq uh, technology can be purchased from Illumina uh, or Thermo Fisher. Uh, and in these examples, you can see that uh, there are data for each of the 24 chromosomes. Uh, for example, here you see an intermediate copy number indicating that there might be evidence of mosaicism uh, for chromosome 5 and that you may have a mixture of cells with, with normal copy number and trisomy copy number uh, for that chromosome. Uh, and you also see similar data with uh, this particular platform. Um, and the real question here though is whether or not this is true signal for mosaicism or due to noise in the technology. One of the things that we've done is to perform a systematic review of studies where embryos were rebiopsied to evaluate whether or not the original biopsy uh, was predictive of the remaining embryo. Uh, in this cohort, there was a 28% euploidy rate, uh, and you can see the distribution for mosaic and full aneuploidy in the original test. And what we found was a significant false positive rate. Uh, when these embryos were retested, uh, uh, there was a 10% false positive rate uh, so that actually 38% were fully euploid. And this primarily originates from overdiagnosing antipodes and, and mosaicism. We think that the true prevalence of mosaicism is approximately 3%, but when you introduce methodologies such as next generation sequencing, uh, what that does is contribute to over predicting the prevalence of mosaicism because of the noise in the methodology itself. We also performed a systematic review looking at 2,759 so-called mosaic embryos that were transferred. Uh, and what was found is that only one, 0.04% uh, of those embryos was actually confirmed in an ongoing pregnancy. So essentially these, um, these mosaicism predictions in the pre-implantation embryo really have no predictive value for actual clinical outcomes. I also wrote an editorial with Dr. Paulson, which suggests that we really do need to stop calling pre-implantation embryos mosaic. And so that's the strategy we have in place at Genomic Prediction. We only designate embryos as euploid or aneuploid uh, and not as mosaic. Our platform is significantly different from what's commonly used. It's not next generation sequencing. It's a high throughput SNP array. We look at over 800,000 positions in the genome, which gives us the highest resolution for evaluating human embryos currently in the industry. We also have the opportunity to, direct, to directly measure uh, mutations. 
And because the platform is commonly used in biobanks, we can establish machine learning algorithms to predict the risk of polygenic disease. One of the reasons this methodology is, is more accurate than next generation sequencing is because we're not limited to the copy number data alone. Uh, this is an example where you can see an increased copy number for chromosome 16, indicating trisomy of that chromosome. But in parallel to that, we also look at genotyping information. So at all the positions in the genome where the embryo is determined to be heterozygous, you have um, one of each allele uh, in a normal chromosome. So you have one allele on one chromosome and one allele on the other chromosome. And so the distribution of the ratios of those two uh, is centered around 50-50. Uh, and you can see that for all of these chromosomes, with the exception of chromosome 16, where you see that pattern uh, shift to a two to one ratio, uh, which is indi indicating that you have two of one allele and one of the other allele and a trisomy. So we can combine these types of information to get a more accurate prediction of aneuploidy in the preimplantation embryo. And as I mentioned, we have the highest resolution available, so we can actually look in more detail at each of the individual chromosomes. Uh, so for example, here, that chromosome 16, uh, we're looking at all of the SNPs along the length of that chromosome, and you can see the two to one ratio um, in more detail. If we have parental DNA, we're able to determine uh, relatively easily where the additional chromosome came from. In this example, it was contributed by the maternal genome, and what's becoming very interesting is the ability to determine the cell division origin of aneuploidy. In this example, because there are two different alleles um, across a good portion of this chromosome, it indicates that it originated from a meiotic error because we have two different homologs present. And when you see all the chromosomes uh, with a two to one ratio, it indicates that you have triploidy. And these are things that would be missed by next generation sequencing. And we've observed them being present in uh, one and a half percent of usable blastocysts. <clears throat> so failing to detect these could also lead to um, increased rate of false negatives by next generation sequencing. Uh, with regard to the overall performance of NextGen, it's relatively subjective. Uh, people are still developing their own criteria for interpreting intermediate copy numbers. It's relatively low resolution and one dimensional because it's limited to copy number. As I said, with Life UPGT, uh, we have the highest resolution available. We're using machine learning interpretation with multiple dimensions, copy number, genotypes, allele ratios, the allele frequencies, for example. And when we do that, we actually do see a significantly different uh, performance in a clinical setting. This was a study performed by one of our clients where they were sending biopsies to three different laboratories in parallel. Uh, the patient demographics were equivalent. It was the same time period. And what you can see is a significantly lower aneuploidy rate with LifeView compared to NextGen. And that leads to also significantly fewer cycles with no euploid embryos available for transfer. We also see a significantly increased clinical pregnancy rate per cycle and a significantly lower clinical loss rate. And I think this is really what most uh, providers care about is, is the actual performance in a clinical setting. So using LifeView provides significantly better outcomes compared to conventional next generation sequencing. We've also made improvements in other areas of PGT, PGT-SR. Uh, for example, most laboratories are, are only able to provide two categories, which are shown here, uh, where they designate embryos as either unbalanced or as normal or carrier. Uh, and, and with the LifeView platform, we, we can actually distinguish between the two. So patients would have an opportunity to identify embryos that don't carry the same balanced translocation that they do. Um, and this type of information, again, is missed by next generation sequencing. So we're often getting cases uh, where patients are interested in, in having this opportunity where other laboratories can't provide it. 
I, I've mentioned the resolution a few times, and this is an example of a case where the breakpoint is very near the centromere and it results in a very small imbalance, uh, which is undetectable by next generation sequencing methods. So again, these are the kinds of cases that we're able to accommodate that other laboratories can't. Um, in this example, you see the two to one ratio in this segment indicating a trisomy. The extra material came from the dad, and this cluster of two different alleles indicates it's meiotic in origin. And this is a, an actual positive control for, for looking at the uh, cell and parental uh, origins of aniputy because we know that the father was the carrier of the translocation and these imbalances originate from meiotic errors. With PGTM, most laboratories are performing something called carrier mapping, which requires a trio. With LifeU PGTM, we're able to directly measure mutations, and, and this allows us to uh, accommodate cases where there might not be family members available, or if there's a risk of recurrence of a de novo mutation. Uh, so again, we can accommodate more uh, cases with the LifeU platform than can be done with, with other laboratories. Uh, a new category that we've introduced uh, is to look at polygenic disease risk. And polygenic risk scoring is a rapidly growing field. Several publications um, have been recently published. And it's really only possible because of the availability of large uh, biobank repositories. The UK Biobank, for example, has 500,000 individuals with 800,000 genotypes and several hundred phenotypes, which gives us over 20 trillion data points to support uh, the testing that we're able to do. And there's quite a bit of interest in, in the field and, and specifically looking at uh, performing this in the general population. For example, with breast cancer, you can identify individuals in the top 3% of genetic risk, shown in red. Um, and the actual development of disease is, is shown so that you see a significant difference significantly higher percentage of patients in the top 3% of genetic risk actually develop breast cancer. So the idea is that you can stratify uh, patients in the high risk category to potentially have more rigorous, more routine monitoring and potentially reduce uh, the prevalence of disease by testing. And because it's just looking at DNA, you can do this very early on before manifestation of disease. Um, you could actually imagine that uh, this same type of strategy can be used to identify and rank embryos based on their risk of, of disease because we're only looking at the DNA from the embryo. Another example is coronary artery disease. <clears throat> and this isn't the, a new concept. Professor Handyside predicted the ability to do this in 1993, Bob Edwards in 1996, and Jacques Cohen in 2000. Uh, and Jacques actually predicted the use of microarray technology would make this possible. The development of polygenic predictors um, involves a series of experiments. So for each of the diseases that we're able to test for, we've gone through uh, these four steps. Uh, the first is to establish a training set. So you show the machine cases and controls and um, the machine then identifies uh, places in the genome that are predictive and can distinguish between cases and controls. You evaluate that on samples that were left out of training in a test set, and then ideally in an independent population validate uh, that the test works. And finally, what we've introduced is uh, a process where we evaluate performance when selecting uh, among siblings, whether or not we achieve a relative risk reduction. And uh, in order to demonstrate this works, one of the first things we had to establish was that the genotyping accuracy in an embryo is equivalent to what we obtain in an adult. And actually, it's better in an embryo because we have parental DNA. Um, we can improve the accuracy of genotyping the embryo because we can use Mendelian inheritance rules. Um, but what that means is, is Essentially, since all we need is DNA and the DNA we're analyzing in the embryo gives us equivalent accuracy to an adult, we don't have to wait for embryos to turn into adults to know whether or not this works. We can look at DNA from existing adults and this example, 11,833 sibling pairs. 
And what we do is, is to compare uh, random selection to genetic selection in terms of what is the prevalence of disease after doing either of those types of selection. In this example, uh, the prevalence of disease is 11%. When we randomly choose one individual, the prevalence remains the same. Uh, but when you use genetic selection in this example, the prevalence re reduces to 3%. And we consider this change, this relative risk reduction, uh, the, this is the way uh, that we demonstrate the clinical utility. Uh, essentially, it's a model for having two euploid embryos. You have to choose one. And if you do so randomly, um, it's, it's not as beneficial when compared to choosing an, a sibling or an embryo uh, using genetic testing. And so we've done that uh, in this study and, and demonstrated significant relative risk reduction with genetic selection compared to random selection for a variety of diseases, which are shown here. Um, and all of these diseases are reduced in parallel. There's actually positive pleiotropy, which means when you choose one individual uh, among the two siblings, you get reduction of all of these diseases in parallel. And interestingly, this, uh, val this has been validated. What we've shown uh, empirically has been validated by uh, two additional groups. One was published in the New England Journal of Medicine confirming significant relative risk reduction uh, when uh, performing genetic selection versus random selection. Another group demonstrated that this concept of ranking embryos actually does in fact work to uh, produce uh, a significant relative risk reduction. Uh, so the idea is that you prioritize the embryo that has the lowest risk for uh, disease. And this is what we refer to as an embryo health score. Uh, we're able to test for the diseases listed here, which include diabetes, heart disease, cancers, uh, and, and uh, schizophrenia. Wanted to provide an example of uh, how this is utilized. This is a, a situation where a couple wanted to do PGTA and we learned during genetic counseling that the partner had type one diabetes. All they had to do was provide saliva so that we could add what we call, again, an embryo health score. This is a composite score taking into account all of the diseases that we can test for and providing one score that can be used to prioritize the embryos uh, for transfer. So in this example, embryo eight would, would be prioritized because it has the highest embryo health score. We also have an independent data set with um, up to five siblings with known uh, type one diabetes status. And so from this, we can see in this example where the couple had five euploid embryos, that there would be a 72% relative risk reduction by choosing one using the embryo health score. Um, but I do wanna point out, it still is a significant benefit even when only two euploid embryos are available for transfer. We've also been able to expand uh, the menu of testing to additional ethnicities, which are shown here. Uh, in every uh, cell where it says yes, we've, we've gone through that four-step process of validating performance for relative risk reduction. We've also developed a way for providers to introduce the patient uh, to polygenic testing, which I think is important. It, in, in my opinion, it's unethic, unethical not to inform the patient uh, of this option. And so we have a video that explains uh, the process. Um, and if a patient is interested in learning more, the provider would uh, indicate that in a test requisition form, which would initiate our process of performing genetic counseling. And in, in that session, we describe the uh, capabilities, limitations, expectations, uh, the pricing. And uh, from that, the patient can then make a decision to move forward or decline polygenic testing. So any patient doing PGT with us would have this option available. Uh, and then from there, um, you would receive, the provider would receive a report uh, that includes obviously antipody testing. Uh, and so you can have a conventional conversation. For example, here the, the patient has five euploid embryos and one aneuploid embryo. 
And they also have embryo health scores. If they have any questions, uh, they can reach out to Genomic Prediction for any uh, follow-up. What I've shown you is, is uh, really that we've advanced uh, conventional PGT testing. In, in PGTA, we have lower false positive rates, higher ongoing pregnancy rates, lower miscarriage rates. Uh, and there's also an opportunity for patients to learn more about the origins of aneuploidy using PGTA+. With PGTSR, we have the ability to distinguish balance from normal, with which many patients um, are, are eager to obtain. And because we have the highest resolution available, we can accommodate more cases than most laboratories. With PGTM, our approach is uh, relatively fast, um, but we can certainly accommodate more cases because we're able to directly measure the mutations uh, in parallel with uh, conventional linkage-based approaches. And then finally, patients using our PGT platform have an opportunity to consider using embryo health scores to reduce the risk of polydynamic disease. Uh, in the last several months, I, I've just listed here some of the uh, IVF client PGT services that have converted to LifeU. Um, and and um, so it, I think illustrates that uh, we're able to make this transition with our clients relatively easily and uh, when they're using a variety of, of uh, competitor providers. Uh, and I'll close by referring you to our, our website, lifeview.com. There's a lot of resources there for patients and providers. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.